Ford GT. Everything you need to know. Hello and welcome back to MIA Luxury Cars. For today's video, we will be going to talk about Ford GT. Everything you need to know. Let's get started. Our narrative starts in 1963, and here's all you need to know to catch up on the Ford GT. Italy. The sale of the Ferrari brand to Henry Ford II was in the last stages of negotiation with Enzo Ferrari. Ford recognized that they didn't really have a performance image and intended to change that. Henry therefore felt it would be simpler to acquire a struggling sports car brand from Europe rather than creating an entirely new automobile. Fortunately, Ferrari was a struggling European automaker at that time. But as Enzo was about to sign the contract selling his namesake to the Americans, he noticed a clause that he didn't seen earlier. With the agreement, Ford would own the Ferrari. With the agreement, Ford would have owned both the Ferrari road car division and the race team. Enzo did not like that. Ferrari stormed out of the room with his lawyer in tow, leaving the Ford. Back home in Dearborn, Henry Ford too gathered his most trusted associates and gave him an order. To do that, the Ford Motor Company turned the British Racing Boutique. The Lola Company had competed in Le Mans before and used Ford small block V8s to do it. Knowing this, Ford offered to do a collaboration on their new race car, kind of like Nelly and Tim McGraw. When it was first introduced to the France in 1964, Ford's first vehicle based on the GT40 MK1 didn't fare very well. They were in the three broken down automobiles. Ford obviously needed to do some work. Carol Shelby, a chicken farmer from Texas and national hero, was the person Ford hired to turn the ship around. Henry reasoned that since his Daytona Coupe had won its class in the year that all the Ford broke, he was the best person to aid in the Ferrari victory. Shelby and his crew began modifying the GT40. They drove the MK1 to Willow Springs to monitor the airflow surrounding the vehicle. According to Shelby, the GT was only losing 75 horsepower due to ventilation. In order to redesign the intels and outlets, they returned to the shop. To make the car stop faster, and last longer, some large old brakes were installed on it. Then Shelby carried out her best maneuvers. He turned the engine to produce more than 450 horsepower. They took the GT to one of the most revered endurance races in the United States, Daytona's 2,000 kilometers. 1,242.74 miles are involved. Nobody anticipated for its performance. Ferrari's car for the 1965 season was fresh after their victory the previous year. Being able to defeat Ferrari in Daytona would be extremely motivating. The Ferrari blew a tire, which fortunately for Shelby team allowed the GT to acquire a sizable lead and win. Ferrari. In 1966, Henry Ford II was getting a little antsy in his little panties. They put so much time and money into these cars but have nothing to show for it. Enzo Ferrari is chilling back at Maranello laughing to himself every night before he goes to sleep. Henry thought to himself, they had to win. Shelby redesigned the GT again, this time with a Goliath 7-liter V8. The the 427 was good for 485 horsepower. It was the same engine Ford was using in NASCAR. It was American. But Shelby wouldn't be only guy racing for Ford. Since Henry was getting a little impatient, he brought in Holman Moody, the guy in charge of Ford's NASCAR program. Henry figured having two teams would create some competition and better his chances of beating Ferrari. And guess what? He was right. The two Ford teams fought hard all season, and when they arrived at Le Mans, it was on. Ford had to remind them. 
the GTs had a strong start when the green flag fell on race day. Three of Shelby's cars were in the lead at 3 in the morning. Additionally, the Ferrari team's most powerful cars had sustained significant damage. Each hour and lap passed, growing tenser than the previous one. Could Ford win at last? At 4 p.m., a triangle of three cars, two Shelby's, one Holman Moody crossed the line in Le Mans. Ferrari had lost to Ford. At Le Mans, the GT would go on to win a three other races, solidifying its place among the all-time great sports cars. It demonstrated that Americans were capable of succeeding on the race truck, not just on ovals, but also on the most revered surface in all of European motorsports, it was somewhat significant. With the GT70, Ford carried on the GT program. But this GT wasn't built for Lehman's. It was designed for the World Rally circuits dusty back roads. Like in NASCAR and in Lehman's, Ford UK aimed to defeat Lancia and Porsche in the rally game. The GT70, however, didn't really succeed in comparison to other endeavors, and the project was abandoned in 1973. Ford hardly ever produced any more sports vehicle after that. They produced sporty vehicles like the Mustang and Escort, but nothing that replicated the GT40's legendary spirit of dominating Lehman's competition. Ford, however, introduced the GT90, a brand new concept in 1995. Ford installed a quad turbo V12 behind the driver on the Jaguar XJ220 supercar chassis with a top speed of 253 miles per hour. This crazy power source made the GT90 concept the fastest car in the entire globe. In 1995, this this beast was putting up Bugatti Veyron numbers, while Coolio was still charting on the Billboard Hot 100. But regrettably, the GT90 was only ever produced as a concept car. Before 2002, Ford enthusiasts would never hear the GT name again. It had been nearly 60 years since Henry Ford's second deal with Ferrari fell through, and to commemorate Ford's crowning achievement, they introduced their GT40 concept car to the world at the Detroit Auto Show. And unlike the GT90 before it, this GT actually made it to production in 2004. The GT made 550 horsepower from a 5.4 liter supercharged V8. Some people believe that the engine is the same as the Ford Lightnings. However, the GT's was made entirely of aluminum, featured more valves, dual fuel injectors, and a dry sump system, and had oil squirters on the piston skirts. The GT40, which was in development from 2004 to 2006, served as as a timely reminder that Ford was capable of producing a world-class supercar. But it would take another 10 years before the GT made a comeback at Lee Mans. Mariah Carey was back on the market as of January 2015. The Sia video included Shia Lee Bioff. And most significantly, Ford once again surprised the globe with the Detroit Auto Show's presentation of the 2016 Ford GT. This time around, the twin-turbo EcoBoost V6 in the new GT produces 647 horsepower. The car weighs slightly more than 3,000 pounds and is nearly entirely made of carbon fiber. The body sides have been carved with buttresses to reduce the drag and direct airflow towards the back wing. When you apply the brakes to slow the automobile down, that wing flattens after it has been deployed at high speeds to control the tail. If you want to take your GT to the truck, you don't have to worry about installing the cage because it already has a cage. This thing is a real race car for the road. 
there were some significant differences between the GT race and street versions. There is a fixed wing, a front splitter, a rear diffuser, and exhaust outlets inside the tail lights. Ford's decision to introduce the GT in 2016 was not an accident. It would mark the 50th anniversary of their Lehman's triumph over Ferrari, and Ford wished to return and triumph once more. Although winning would be nice, other people also enjoy it. If Ford wanted the check red flag, they were going to have to flight for it, since competitors Chevy and Ferrari weren't going to let old blue grab the wind just because it was his anniversary. This crew carried the burden of carrying the Ford name forward. Amazingly, in qualifying, the two American GT cars secured the front row, with Ferrari following closely in third. It was all set up for war. The 2016 24 hours of Le Mans got underway behind a safety car as torrential rain lashed the race truck. Following the start, Ford and Ferrari traded the lead throughout the day, while contending with other vehicles and technical problems. It appeared for a while that Ford wouldn't be able to win that day. The leading Ferrari was eventually passed by the number 68 GT on the Mulsanne Strait with four and a half hours remaining. The Ferrari then spun a few laps later, leaving the Ford plenty of breathing room. What have you learned about our topic? Please let me know by leaving a comment below. And if you enjoy this video, please click the like button, turn on the notification bell, and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Thank you for stopping by to watch. See you in our next video.